Dear participants to this inaugural lecture, I hope that you can all hear me. Yes, thank you. I already received one uh, positive sign. The reason is that I cannot clearly see what is happening on uh, the screen. Uh, it's 5.30 on the 20th January of 2020. This is what we would call Inauguration Day. And it has, of course, a double meaning today, Inauguration Day uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And both are, I think, equally important for different reasons, um, however. In the meantime, I would like to welcome uh, Rector Rick van der Wallen, uh, who has joined us, uh, the Executive Director of the Franqui Foundation, uh, uh, who I think has also joined us, uh, but of course also the promoter of the Franqui Chair, Professor Dambour, and the Laureate of the International Franqui Chair uh, of this year, Professor Thomas Spekerboer. And of course, I would also like to welcome all of you. You are in great numbers, in large numbers today, and maybe in larger numbers than on the other side of the Atlantic. We have planted some flags on the inner yard of the faculty building, which of course you cannot see to make some more similarities, but maybe above all, we will uh, deal with very important uh, issues today, as you will hear in a minute from the inaugural lecture by Professor Thomas Spekerboer. The International Franqui Chair is, of course, a privilege given to uh, scholars of very high international reputation and is therefore uh, with pleasure that I uh, would like to welcome Professor Spekerboer uh, to give his lecture. But before uh, turning to the introduction of Professor Spekerboer by the Collega Proximus, uh, Professor uh, Marie-Benedicte Dambour, I'm happy to give the floor to uh, Professor, uh, uh, sorry, to the Executive Director of the uh, Franqui uh, Foundation, uh, who unfortunately, of course, will not be able to uh, introduce physically the candidate, but who also is, if I'm correct, uh, um, and if everything works well, uh, present uh, online. Uh, Professor Van Moerbeke, I would like you to uh, try to uh, switch on your camera and your microphone so as to uh, give your introduction to the yes. um, ceremony of today. And this seems uh, to work well, Professor Van Moerbeke. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Ja, uh, meneer de rector, meneer de decaan, waarde collega's, chers collega, ladies and gentlemen. It is my, can you hear me well? Is it, is it clear? It is perfect. Yeah. Okay, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, friends, at the occasion of the inaugural lecture of Professor Thomas Spijkerboer, who holds the International Franqui Chair for 20. 2021, at uh, the invitation of many institutions, eight institutions, we preside the University of Ghent as host institution, together with the University, University of Antwerp, the ULB, the VUB, the KU Leuven, UC Louvain, University of Saint Louis, and University of Hasselt. I should also mention the Human Rights Center. I cannot resist spending a few words on the origin of the foundation. Indeed, the, per, the birth of the Franqui Foundation in 1932 is a fortunate stroke of serendipity. It is a story of the right people at the right time, at the right place. The seeds of the foundation go back to the late 1890s in China, when Emile Franqui, the Belgian envoy, and Herbert Hoover, a mining engineer at the helm of an international mining corporation, were at the same table uh, bidding for contracts in coal mines and railways in Wuhan, China. A decade or so later, World War I broke out, which left the Belgian population in a state of anxiety and starvation. American President Woodrow Wilson, aware of the Belgian destruction, made an appeal to his fellow Americans to donate funds for Belgium's relief. He asked Herbert Hoover, stationed in London at the time, who himself contacted his old friend from China, Emile Franqui, to organize that relief. 
which actually was very was organized very efficiently. Once World War I came to an end, Emile Francky fought a political battle to set the remaining funds aside with the purpose to boast academic life and scientific endeavor. He then was Herbert Hoover, president of the US from 1929 to 1933, who insisted on the name Francky Foundation. It was then set up by all decree of 1932 as a private institution of so-called public utility, the Stichting van Openbaar Nut, Fondation d'Utilité Publique, and with a clear purpose to further the development of higher education and scientific research in Belgium. Having become a substantial player on the Belgian academic scene, the foundation's activities revolve around several areas. The foundation awards the yearly Francky Prize, which is the largest and most prestigious award given to a scientist active in Belgium under the age of 50. It is decided by a purely international jury and is presented every year by the King of Belgium. The Francky Prizes alternate between medicine, exact sciences and the humanities. Also, the foundation sponsors Francky Chairs, where a scientist lectures for a week or so in a Belgian university. The Francky research professorships give outstanding researchers the opportunity to focus on their research with a redu reduced teaching load and this for a three-year period. Presently, we have about a dozen such chairs in Belgium. And two years ago, we started awarding the Francky startup grants aiming at attracting top talents in our universities. But let me return to, to today's team. So that is namely the International Francky Chairs. Those international chairs have been one of the core activities of the Francky Foundation since its inception. The foundation has attracted top researchers to hold the International Francky Chair in a wide range of disciplines. These chairs have been conceived to cover an extended and uninterrupted interrupted stay of a foreign scientist in Belgium. The International Francky Professor must be presented by at least two Belgian universities. He or she is expected to play an active role in the scientific life of the host universities through lectures, seminars and advice. And the chair has a distinguished history indeed. Incidentally, the first Francky Chair was in 1932 to Henry Henri Piren, a prominent historian at the University of Ghent. An international Francky chair went to Peter de Bay from Cornell University in 1933, and he received a Nobel Prize of Chemistry a few, a, few, a few years later, and so on. In 2020, we are honored to welcome Thomas Spekerbuch. Professor of Migration Law at the VU, the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. He holds a Master in Law from Amsterdam. He became a practicing lawyer for a number of years and then obtained a Doctorate of Law from the Radboud University in Nijmegen. His doctoral dissertation on gender and refugee status earned him the 2001 Research Prize from the Premium Erasmanium Foundation and was also published as an Ashgate monograph. In his thesis, uh, Thomas Spiegelburg surveys the jurisprudence in some Western countries regarding the admittance of female asylum seekers and the grounds on which the asylum is granted or denied. From a careful investigation of the dossiers, he finds a definite pattern in the legal decision process. Since then, Thomas Spekerbo has extensively written and lectured on international migration and refugee laws from many points of view, like gender, sexuality, border deaths, and from the colonial point of view, etc. He has become a world-leading researcher in this area 
which is attested by his membership in the KNAU, the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and by his many keynote addresses at international conferences. He also holds the uh, Raoul Wallenberg Chair of Human Rights at Lund University in Sweden, and has has mentored and influenced numerous young people through master classes all over the world. Europe and the West have, have been confronted more than ever with the burning issue of how to cope with migrations and refugees. It will be in, interesting to see how the new US president who is being uh, inaugurated right this moment will tackle this question. So therefore we are definitely looking forward to Thomas Spikerwood's lecture on the, colon the colonial structure of international migration laws. Finally, we wish uh, Professor Spikerwood a fruitful but also enjoyable interaction with the group of uh, Professor Marie Benedicte d'Ambourg at the Ghent Faculty of Law and Criminology, but also with the many partner universities. And on behalf of the board of directors of the Franqui Foundation, I'd like to award the International Franqui Professor Baker the Franqui Medal as a token of the foundation appreciation for his work. So this is the medal which will be handed physically to him probably later in the year. But so it's a token of the appreciate for his work and we are we are proud to have him occupy this chair thank you very much thank you very much professor van moerbeker for your kind words and on behalf of the faculty and university i would like of course to thank the frankie foundation for supporting uh, financially and otherwise uh, this kind of international academic endeavors which of course are very important let me now give the floor to Professor Marie-Benedicte Dambour. She is the promoter of this uh, international Franqui chair, uh, the initiator of that. She managed in a quite short time to, uh, uh, to, to um, uh, group a network uh, of universities around the candidacy or at least uh, kind of the, the application of Thomas Spekerboer. Um, I would uh, also, as a kind of introduction, uh, Marie Benedict, thank you as well for uh, being with us. You have uh, joined Ghent University just less than two years ago as the holder of an advanced ERC grant uh, after a rich career at the University of Brighton. You experienced more or less your personal Brexit avant la lettre. Uh, I'm very happy that you made that decision to uh, choose Ghent as a host institution. Um, and, and I think this is a, a clearly a, a mutually beneficial uh, relationship that we have built since then. Uh, you haven't missed your entree in Ghent University, having taken up quite some very important initiatives among which that uh, uh, Franqui uh, chair um, you have promoted. So I gladly give you the floor for your introduction to the candidate. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Uh, dear executive director of the Franqui Foundation, dear rector, dear dean, dear Thomas, dear colleagues, students, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Spakerbourg lecture tonight, and this for a number of reasons. One is that having lost myself in the UK for a few decades, I've come back to Belgium and have been delighted to uh, see firsthand and being able to participate in this inter-university collaboration. And for this, I thank, of course, the Franqui Foundation, but also my colleagues from, uh, as you, from, from all the corners of Belgium. Um, another is that the lecture that we are about to hear is very important. It's important and possibly it's also disturbing, but to me it's also very fitting that it is being promoted through me from within the Human Rights Center. In short, the point that we will need to take and then to repeat to ourselves and to others over and over again is that we may wish that colonialism would be behind us, but it is not 
behind us. It's not because it continues to structure our lives in a very deep way. Now, um, sometimes pictures can say things more powerfully than words. And so I am going to try to share my screen with you. Hopefully, oh, I need to. Okay, so uh, I think you are seeing this picture now. And this is a picture which was taken in the Belgian Congo in the 1950s. I think I had never seen it until last summer, which, um, you know, is um, slightly surprising to me because when I showed it to my son, he said, oh, every nobody has seen this picture. It's very, very famous. It's very well known. Um, and even though I had done my doctorate on the Belgian Congo, I had never come across it. Um, so I was intrigued and I kind of um, wanted to know where it had come from, how it had appeared. And it turns out that it's Lewis Hamilton, the Formula One only black racer, who of course has used his world championship to promote the Black Lives Matter movement who had put it on his social media. And with over 13 million followers, the picture quickly did the rounds which allowed my son to put me right. Um, now, I think the reason, um, the, the, the way Lewis Hamilton himself came across it is that um, uh, I need to go to the next picture. Up, oh, I'm there. Sorry about that. So um, the the picture was used on the cover of a book which has been published this year by Belgian historian Paul Van Dam. Um, and so I. I here, I'm not going to analyze in which ways uh, the relations that the picture depicts might be, can be, are shocking. But the only thing I want to say at the moment is that colonialism continues to structure much of our lives. Now, this is true at a personal level, but it's also true at an institutional level. Clearly, it is easier for a white person to forget about this than for a black person. Last week, um, a professor, an associate professor of African politics at the University of Oxford wrote the long read of the Guardian newspapers. Um, what um, Simukai Shigudu wanted to say was that he has lived along, uh, along the, the long shadow of Cecil Rhodes, the British mining magnate who was also uh, politically active in Southern Africa and actually gave his name to both Northern and Southern Rhodesia today Zambia and Zimbabwe, as well as to Rhodes House at Oxford, which holds the African Library, as well as to Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, maybe, you know, one of the most famous Rhodes Scholar having been Bill Clinton. Now, what Simuka Ishiguru says, and he says that extremely movingly and in, in great um, detail and sophistication is that Cecil Rhodes and everything that Rhodes embodied has shaped all the worlds through which he has moved. And that um, that is really shaped, that has shaped obviously his life, but also the lives of, uh, of so many of us. Now, it's quite interesting that Emile Franchi, who unlike Rhodes, had no country named after him, was nonetheless also 
uh, seem to have been also a man of colonialism. The biography uh, that uh, we find on the Franke Foundation website mentions that he was an officer in the Congo Free State of Leopold II and that he also managed well, became the managing director of the mining union of Upper Kantanga. And so I think maybe there is irony, but perhaps also logic in the fact that it is thanks to the Franke Foundation that we are together tonight to learn about the colonial structure of international migration law. I hope we all agree that this is an important if uncomfortable task, but um, I think, Thomas, that we are ready to listen to you. And so I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Rector. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by showing you a map. And for that, I have to share my screen. Okay, this should be it. Um, is this okay? You can see the map? Good, thank you. Now, on this map, nationals of countries that are white need a visa for less than 100 countries. And nationals of countries that are gray on this map need in entry visa for more than 100 countries. This map that was developed by Yusuf Altamimi visualizes the global inequality of mobility. It visualizes, in other words, the effects of international migration law. Roughly speaking, people from Europe, from the Anglophone settler societies in North America, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as from South Korea and Japan, can move across the world with great ease, while Asians, Africans, and South, South Americans cannot. Although this blunt summary has to be qualified and actually has been uh, qualified, the general picture doesn't change as a consequence of those qualifications. So this map suggests that global mobility is unequal along lines of race and colonial history. But is that really the case? That would be remarkable because international migration law does not differentiate on the ground of race, but of nationality. Also, differentiation on the ground of race would be an evident violation of the prohibition of racial discrimination. As Achille Mbembe and others have shown, the concept of race was developed in close connection with colonialism. If we want to investigate the possible relation between international migration law on the one hand and colonialism and race on the other, we should use a methodology that does not a priori exclude the possibility of noticing the role of colonialism and race. On the basis of insights of Sergio Diaz, I take it that this has three consequences. First, from a temporal perspective, we should use a timeline that makes it possible to see the role of colonialism, if any, and not to begin our analysis in, for example, 1990 to 2015, which are important uh, years for Europe, but not necessarily for the world. Second, structurally, we cannot automatically assume that with formal independence, the dependence of countries in the global south resulting from colonialism has ended. Thirdly, from an epistemic point of view, the analysis cannot be limited to the acts of former colonial powers and must fully include the acts of colonized and marginalized regions. This methodology does not necessarily lead to the finding that international migration law is colonial or racialized, maybe it's not, but it's an effort to make it possible to see colonial and racial phenomena if and to the extent they, they are present. As a consequence, I will start with a historical overview of international migration law, a brief one. The earliest source that I'm aware of dates back to the early 16th century. Francisco de Vitoria was an early modern Spanish academic, and he was an advisor to Emperor Charles V. In a lesson he gave in 1532, De Indis, he touched upon the question whether the Spanish colonists had the right to seize the lands of Native Americans. He opens this discussion with the right to migrate. 
Vittoria poses that there is a right to travel and to live in other countries, provided one does not harm the natives. To keep people who do no harm, that is the Spanish, out of the territory, that is of the Americas, is an act of war. So to keep people out is an act of war. Vittoria argues that the Spanish colonists can defend themselves against such an act of war by the Native Americans by seizing their territory. So for Vittoria, a refusal to allow the immigration of Spanish colonists may justify Spanish colonization. And whether or not foreigners harm, foreigners like the Spanish harm the interest of natives is to be decided by an objective standard that is by learned persons such as Vittoria himself, and that's not the prerogative of the natives. Almost a century later, in 1609, Hugo de Groot, a member of the political elite of the Dutch Republic, published Mare Liberum, the Free Sea. The question de Groot addresses is whether the Portuguese have the right to deny the Dutch the use of the seas in the East Indies, in what is now Indonesia. De Groot asserts that it is an unimpeachable rule of the law of nations that every nation is free to travel to every other nation and to trade with it. This right to travel abroad logically includes the right to go ashore and to erect buildings there, provided this can be, can be done without bothering others. And if this right to trade including the right to travel and reside, is refused, that is a legitimate ground for war. In 1625, de Groot developed a similar position in his magnum opus De Jure Belliac Pacis. And this position was not theoretical, but justified Dutch colonization in the East Indies, which included the sort of acts of war that de Groot argued were legitimate. One of these was the extermination of most of the approximately 15,000 inhabitants of the island of Banda, under the command of Jan Pietersz Koen in 1621. The VOC, the Dutch East India Company, then transferred slaves to Banda in order to restore the labor force. It should be noted that in contrast to Vitoria, the Groot uses terminology that emphasizes the temporary character of stay. This may be related to the Groot's vision of empire, which was not primarily oriented at territorial acquisition, but at mar maritime and mercantile supremacy. But nonetheless, the right to go to war, if the Groot's right of free passage was violated, made permanent occupation of vanquished ter territories justified. And therefore, the Groot reached a conclusion that is similar to that of Vitoria. Now, fast forward yet another century. In, 16, in, in 1758, the Swiss jurist Emer de Vatel published Le Droit des Gens. While for Vittoria and the Groot, colonial expansion was the primary context of their work, Vattel focused primarily on international law in the relation between European states. And he develops the position of Vittoria and the Groot on migration. Instead of emphasizing the right to travel, he also argues that states have a right to exclude foreigners. But if they do so, this must be justified. Exclusion without justification is an abuse of this state right to exclude foreigners. A modification on the side of Vattel of the positions of Vittoria and de Groot is that Vattel says that, and this is a quote, by virtue of its natural li liberty, it is to the nation to judge whether it is or whether it is not in a position to receive this foreigner. This move, uh, states are bound by international law, but states themselves interpret it, is characteristic for Vattel's approach to international law in general. The gradual abolition of slavery during the 19th century led to labor force problems in the European colonies and also in the new American territories in the far west. While the United Kingdom and the Netherlands introduced indentured labor, predominantly by people from the Indian subcontinent in their colonies, the United States, for lack of colonies, could not relocate colonial subjects and attracted Chinese and later Japanese laborers. This need to attract foreign labor can explain a treaty concluded in 1868 
shortly after the abolition of slavery in the US, in which China and the US recognized, uh, and I quote, the inherent and inalienable right of man to change his home and allegiance, and also the mutual advantage of free migration and emigration of their citizens from one country to the other for purposes of curiosity of trade or as permanent residents, end of quote. This provision in the treaty is an articulation of the right to migrate reflecting the spirit of Vitoria and the Groot, but this time to legitimize Chinese migration towards the American West Coast. However, this inalienable and inherent right of Chinese to migrate didn't last long. The success in attracting Chinese laborers to the American West Coast led to concerns about the dominance of white people, of the white majority. And this resulted in the first immigration laws aiming at restricting Chinese immigration. These so-called Chinese exclusion laws, that was their name, were challenged in court. This resulted in a series of judgments of the US Supreme Court, the Chinese exclusion cases. The US Supreme Court held that the power of exclusion of foreigners is an incident of sovereignty. And therefore, the government is free to consider, and I quote, the presence of foreigners of a different race in this country who will not assimilate with, this, to, with us to be dangerous to its peace and security, end of quote, and to exclude them on that ground. This was an abrupt change of legal doctrine. Migration was not the inalienable right of man. It had still been in 1532, in 1609, or even in 1868, but was declared not to be a right of man at all. Quite the opposite. The right was one of states as a function of their sovereignty to control migration at will. Immigration legislation modeled on the US exclusion legislation quickly spread. And the new legal doctrine it gave rise to asserting an absolute power of states to control migration was adopted across the Anglophone world, although usually without its explicit re reference to race. The state of the law is now, as the US Supreme Court stated in the 1972 standard case, that I quote, over no conceivable subject is the legislative power of Congress more complete than it is over the admission of aliens, end of quote. And as a consequence, judicial supervision is marginal. I now ask you to fast forward one more time to 1985. 1985 is the year in which the European Court of Human Rights gave the Abdulaziz judgment in which it adopted the legal doctrine developed by the US Supreme Court in the Chinese exclusion cases. In order to understand these judgments, we have to look at European mobility regimes during and after decolonization. After World War II, European colonial states were not aware that the next decades were to be about decolonization. They thought they were reshaping the relation between metropole and colonies in the direction of a federation or a commonwealth. During this process, European colonial powers granted citizenship to colonial subjects. And as a consequence, citizens, including citizens of African or, or Asian origin, could move three, freely throughout the French, British or Dutch territories, including towards the metropole. Now the United Kingdom was the first of the decolonizing empires to gradually undermine this free mobility regime within the Commonwealth through legislation between 1962 and 1981. Free movement towards the UK was ended and former colonial subjects were now treated as undesirable foreigners and were subject to more restrictive migration laws than European or American nationals. Mobility rights were related to genealogy. Commonwealth citizens with a parent born in the United Kingdom, in practice whites, had the right to move to the United Kingdom, while others, non-whites, did not because they, they were to be treated as immigrants. This prevented non-white people to move from African and Asian Commonwealth countries to Britain, while it did not prevent whites to do so. That was a reversal of the free mobility regime put in place immediately after World War II. 
this was the context in which the case law of the European Commission and Court of Human Rights has developed since the 1960s. This development and its contestation by, among others, the Women in Immigration and, Na and Nationality Group, a British uh, activist group, culminated in the Abdul Aziz judgment. Today, this judgment is still the standard reference for the court's position on migration, including asylum and human rights. The court ruled that as a matter of well-established international law and subject to its treaty obligations, a state has the right to control the entry of non-nationals into its territory. However, the court stated it is not to be excluded that measures in the field of immigration may affect the right to respect for family life, but states have a wide margin of appreciation in that respect. The court followed the US Supreme Court, including that the exclusion of foreigners does not need justification, quite the opposite. Couples, the Abdul Aziz judgment was about family reunion, couples need to justify why they prefer living in the European country where one of the spouses lives instead of in another country. In addition, while the court did find that U UK law constituted gender discrimination for reasons that I will not go into, it did not find racial discrimination. In spite of the clear and pretty unembarrassed aim of the British legis legislation at stake to limit the number of non-white immigrants from the former colonies, the court held, and I quote, that the mass immigration against which the rules were directed consisted mainly of would-be immigrants from the new Commonwealth in Pakistan, and that as a result, they affected at the material time fewer white people than others is not a sufficient reason to consider them as racist in character. It is an effect which derives not from the content of the 1980 rules, but from the fact that among those wishing to immigrate, some ethnic group outnumbered others." End of quote. The court chose to ignore that the group of those wishing to immigrate uh, was carefully defined so that white people from the new, new Commonwealth in Pakistan were not part of that group, but had a right to enter as citizens. This concludes my brief overview of international, uh, historical overview of international migration law. Let us look at the map once more. The historical overview confirms that what we see on the map is a reflection of colonial history and as a consequence is closely connected to race. One might object that the map reflects difference in wealth, which arguably can justify unequal access to mobility. I'm inclined to think that it's correct to say that the map reflects differences in wealth. However, authors as diverse as Walter Rodney, Kenneth, Kenneth uh, Pomeranz, Prasanan Partasarati and Toma Piketty have shown that the unequal international distribution of wealth is also a, history, is a product of colonial history. The unequal distribution of wealth and mobility are both enduring legacies of that history. What is referred to as international migration law is in fact overwhelmingly the international law of Europe and its descendants in settler colonies in North America, Australia and New Zealand. This European international migration law has developed as part of the processes of coloni colonization and racialization. It has resulted and it continues to result today in a right of Europeans and their descendants to travel across the world while, while people from South America, Africa and Asia do not have that right. And mind you, between the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century alone, at least 62 Europeans 62 million Europeans actually used this right to migrate. This was not only free migration. Many Europeans were forced to populate the colonies by the state or by poverty, by their class position. At the other end of the spectrum, there is the unfree migration of racialized enslaved people, both in the transatlantic slave trade and in the East Indies. An estimated 12.5 million people were moved forcibly in the uh, transatlantic slave trade. 
An observation of Anne Stoller and Frederick Cooper is particularly relevant here, namely that Europe itself was made by its imperial projects as much as the colonized regions, regions were shaped by Europe. We can only understand the history of international migration law as well as its present if we see it if we see its intimate relation with colonialism and race. Daniel Thum concludes that international migration law is based on a fundamental normative assumption of sedentarism, while Bas Schotel and Marie de Benedict Tambour have used the more argumentative terms exclusion without justification and Strasbourg reversal. Their analyses are not historical, but restate today's state of affairs. It will come as no surprise that this sedentarist approach, which dominates legal doctrine in the global north, is shared by states and regional organizations in the global north, such as the European Union. However, academic work also takes this global north approach to constitute international migration law. In textbooks, the global north approach is considered as inherent in the very notion of state sovereignty. In doing so, academic work ignores the colonial origins of international migration law and it naturalizes its racialized character. I will now turn to the second part of my talk, which addresses non-European perspectives in international migration law. Regional case law in Africa and the Americas does not necessarily accept this global north legal doctrine. Legal actors there do not find it obvious that the unequal legal mobility re regime sits easily with international law. A first example of a different approach can be found in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This court has ruled that equality and non-discrimination are peremptory norms of international law, also known as just cogets. This means that equality and non-discrimination are norms from which no derogation is permitted. The Inter-American Court lists migration status, that is having or not having a residence right, as a prohibited discrimination ground. Now, this does not mean that states cannot make any distinction between nationals and non-nationals or between documented and undocumented migrants. In other words, states can make migration laws, but exclusion requires justification, unlike in the European system. The Inter-American Court requires that such distinctions are reasonable, objective, proportionate, that they are not discriminatory and do not harm human rights. Diego, Diego Acosta has shown that this is not an isolated phenomenon limited to the Inter-American Human Rights Court in San Jose, but is an expression of a wider development in South America. Similarly, the African Commission of Human and People's Rights holds that the ex expulsion of foreigners may violate the right to property, the right to work, the right to education, the right to family life, the right to equality, the right to an effective remedy, as well as the prohibitions of mass expulsion and of refoulement. Only after addressing these issues, it acknowledges that states can take legal action against undocumented migrants. These African and American supervisory bodies interpret human rights treaties of which, for our purposes, the text does not differ substantially from the European Convention on Human Rights and, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These African and American supervisory bodies have an equal claim to formulate international law as the European Court of Human Rights does, but they take a fundamentally different starting point to international migration law by putting the burden of, just, of justification the burden, the burden of justification for exclusion with states instead of putting the burden of justification for non-exclusion with individuals. They apply human rights law as it is applied in all, in all other fields of law, also by states, courts and doctrines of the global north. They apply it in the normal way. This pluralism this contestation of international law as formulated by the Global North is also visible in more general international law issues. 
As an example, I want to look at jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a general international law concept, but I take the example from the field I know best, which is migration. States in the global north, the European Union, the United States, Canada, Australia, they try to combat migration by preventing people from reaching their territory, by keeping them far away from their borders. A problem for the global north is that international law does not allow them to enforce their migration policies on the territories of other states unless these states give explicit consent. States in the global north have addressed this problem in two ways, and one is tempted to say states in the global north have circumvented the prohibition of extraterritorial enforcement of their domestic laws in two ways. First, since the 1990s, they require airlines and ferry companies to refuse embarkation to people without the necessary documents, passport, visa. Through this forcing airlines to enforce their laws, states in the global north force private actors to do what these states themselves are not, not allowed to do, namely to enforce their domestic laws on the territory of another state. Secondly, global north states take over state functions in, in third countries. For example, European states have written and implemented legislation in Niger and Libya. In this way, they quite possibly violate human rights norms, but formally these violations will have been committed by third states. Another country in which uh, such instrumentalization of states in the global south uh, has happened is the Australian policy to offshore its asylum system to Nauru and Papua New Guinea. Such offshoring implies, amongst others, detention in Papua New Guinea of asylum seekers who asked for asylum in Australia. And this is detention for unlimited duration under, let's put it clinically, under substandard conditions. A case about the legality of this Australian offshore detention reached the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court of, Judge, of Justice. In a judgment, judgment from 2016, the PNG, the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court, ruled that this detention was unconstitutional because it had no, basic, no basis in domestic law. And the court ordered the Papua New Guinea government to end detention. However, the court ordered the PNG government, as well as Australia, to take the necessary steps to end the detention. In doing so, it went against the international law principle of state immunity. This principle holds that states cannot be sued in the courts of other states unless they have explicitly agreed to that. A criminal or civil law case against Australia can in principle only take place before Australian courts. Nonetheless, the PNG Supreme Court gives an order against Australia. Regrettably, the court does not explicitly explain why it finds it appropriate to do so despite the principle of state immunity. However, if we read the judgment carefully, it is evident why the court did this. It points out that as part of Australian asylum policy, asylum seekers were transferred to the PNG by Australian federal police and were placed in a detention center of which the construction and the day-to-day -day operation were funded by Australia. And when it appeared that this was contrary to PNG domestic law, Australia provided technical assistance to try to remedy this. They sent a few lawyers. As the court puts it, the PNG government had, I quote, decided in favor of accommodating Australia's wish in exchange for certain monetary and other considerations. End of quote. On these grounds, the PNG Supreme Court of Justice concluded that the Australian government assisted the PNG government with the illegal transfer and, de and detention of asylum seekers, and as a consequence, the Australian government is to be held responsible for it. This bold and abrupt move of the PNG Supreme Court of Justice can be understood as a response to the hands off case law of the Australian judiciary, which has accepted the offshoring scheme 
by limiting the scope and intensity of its own judicial scrutiny. As we have seen in the historical part of this talk, such judicial application, the term is uh, of Linda Bosniak, such judicial application is typical of international migration law since the Chinese exclusion cases. The Australian judiciary has chosen not to engage in meaningful human rights and constitutional scrutiny of Australia's offshore asylum policy. Application of the principle of state immunity by the PNG Supreme Court would have allowed Australia to export this judicial application that characterizes so-called international migration law to Papua New Guinea. Because of this, one can characterize the PNG Supreme Court's decision to ignore the principle of state immunity as a contestation of international migration law. Obviously, the PNG Supreme Court of Justice does not have the power to end the Australian policy of offshoring its asylum policy to its global south neighbors. But what it, what it can do, it does. By not accepting that Australia co can rely on the doctrine of state immunity so as to impose the sedentarist vision of international migration law on the sovereign state of, sovereign state of Papua New Guinea. I do not have time to linger on other situations, but the problem is far from unique. The US Supreme Court, the EU Court of Justice, and the European Court of Human Rights have, like their Australian counterpart, adapted their scrutiny in such a way that the externalization of migration policy is not at all, or not in a meaningful manner, subject to judicial scrutiny. Not only the PNG Supreme Court of Justice has responded to this, so has the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. In a carefully reasoned advisory opinions on asylum and another one on the environment, it has interpreted the notion of positive obligations in such a manner that states may be responsible for the foreseeable and in the case of external migration policy, intended extraterritorial effects of their policies. Such reasoning remains well within acceptable interpretation methods of international law, but at the same time may prevent the legal vacuum that the courts of the global north creates with so much care and so much craftsmanship, so as to allow, to allow their states to do abroad what they cannot do at home. I will now turn off the slideshow. Yeah. Um, not all courts in the global south are inclined to take such an approach, of course. By way of example, human rights activists in Libya litigated against the Memorandum of Understanding, a kind of informal treaty between Italy and Libya in, of 2017. And this Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, is instrumental in Europe's offshore policy. They succeeded to get the MOU suspended in first instance by the appeals court in Tripoli, but the Libyan Supreme Court used a construction, construction similar to one used by the EU Court of Justice in a humanitarian visa case to declare itself not competent to hear the case. So it stepped back. Courts, states, regional organizations and academics in the global south may and at times do express support for the sedentarist approach to international migration law. Just think of the mass expulsions which led to the case law of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And reversely, there is critique within, within the global north. An example could be the Hirsi Jama versus Italy judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, which did limit state sovereignty. Location does not determine legal doctrine, but at the same time, it is not to be ignored that, for example, many state officials, judges and academics in Africa have different normative responses to the visa map I showed a few minutes ago than their colleagues in Europe. If one stops to sideline the positions from the global south, the normative pluralism, the normative disagreement, the contestation is hard to ignore. The different interpretations of international human rights law from courts in the global south is overwhelmingly 
ignored in the global north. For example, in its recent case law, the European Court of Human Rights has not referred to the 2018 advisory opinion on asylum of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, despite its obvious relevance. In academic work too, legal doctrine from the global south, case law, legislation, academic writing, is most often simply not registered at all. And to, this, to the extent it is noted, it is seen as being of purely local relevance. Anthony Engie has the, called this the dynamic of difference. This tendency to equate the global north with the universal, the abstract and the general, and the global south with the specific, the concrete and the local is, and I'm afraid I cannot think of a friendlier term, is colonial. My intention is not to criticize particular authors or journals. The observation that international migration law has a colonial structure is a critique of a field of which I have been part for decades, and it applies as much to myself as to others. The interlinkage between academic work and colonialism is underlined by the Franchi chair, which I am honored to hold at the moment. Volume four of the Biographie Coloniale Belge from 1955 praises Emile Franchi, after whom this chair is named as a pillar of Belgian colonialism. To sum up, colonialism and as a consequence race is a central element of international migration law. I'm not sure what an appropriate met metaphor is. Race is part of the grammar of the deep structure of our field. It's what makes it possible. Without colonialism and without race, international migration law would not exist. We would not be able to formulate utterances about migration law. And this is as much the case today as it was in 1532. And like in 1532, this is contested in particular by legal actors on the receiving end of the resulting inequality. This is not to say that race is the only part of this grammar, of this deep structure. I have hinted at the close relation between colonialism and class by referring to the crucial role of labor. And this needs further reflection in the footsteps of materialist social scientists like Saskia Sassen and Nicolas de Genova. Another crucial element of the field is gender. Reproduction of the population and racial mixture have been themes in international migration law from the very beginning. Vittoria worries about it. In her work on family and the nation, Sarah van Walsen has analyzed the ongoing influence of colonial gender dynamics in contemporary family, family reunion, asylum and labor migration law. So what? Now what? Shall we conclude that all this is very unjust? To be honest, I think it's very hard to think anything else. As Thomas Piketty has remarked more broadly, contemporary inequality is strongly and powerfully structured by the system of borders, nationalities, and the related social and political rights. However, I'm not sure what the mere conclusion of illegitimacy brings us. Colleagues with similar concerns to mine have proposed the notion of border justice. But that seems problematic because as we have seen, the injustice of borders is not marginal. How can the borders between global north and global south be just without much more comprehensive forms of justice? And then alternatively, doesn't all this suggest an ideal of no borders or open borders? There's a similar problem to that. Without comprehensive forms of global justice, open borders may lead to undercutting social standards in social democracies. That is why the idea of open borders is so dear to the editors of The Economist and the, and the Wall Street Journal. As someone from a Northern European social democracy identifying with that egalitarian tradition, maybe I do not have the distance needed to think beyond this dilemma. I do find the suggestion of Tendaya Chuma very inspiring where she acknowledges the right of, of a community to control access, but then redefines the community that has this right as a transnational community with post-colonial ties, 
bringing together former colonies and metropoles. However, policies of the global north are currently expanding and reinforcing the exclusion of Asians, Africans and Latinos without justification. They do so not merely by making entry requirements more stringent, but also by intensifying externalization. Also, as Chimney has observed, the global compacts on migration and refugees can be seen as efforts of the global north to make countries in the global south, as well as international organizations and civil society, speak its language and to adopt the Chinese exclusion legal doctrine. In other words, the compacts can be seen as hegemonic projects. And on the basis of the analysis I propose, it makes sense to object to such hegemonic projects because they're based on ignoring and sidelining perspectives from the global south. But also I want to emphasize that my critique is first and foremost most methodological. If international law claims to be international, it cannot, in the words of Ashil Mbembe, make generalizations from idioms of provincialism make generalizations from idioms of provincialism. It is of course true that in this manner, it becomes clear that legal methodology is inseparable from politics. But because the focus of my critique is methodological, so is my response. And that response is that in plain and simple words, as researchers and educators in the global north, we need to begin taking sources from the, from the global south seriously. Legislation, case law, state practice and academic writings from the global south have to be conceptualized as sources of international law and not as activistic exoticisms. This also means that the history of international migration law should include, for example, the Ottoman, Mughal, Arab and Chinese legacies. For unwritten legal traditions, innovative research methods may have to be developed such as, such as those suggested by Judge Weir Mantri in the Hungary versus Slovakia judgment, or in the Oath of Manden, a 13th century human rights catalog from the Mali Empire. In addition, the colonial structure of international migration law makes it necessary to include the legal regulation of slavery and the slave trade into our field. This is partly for historical reasons. The slave trade was large scale, economically induced forced migration, but also the history, the legal history of slavery would allow for understanding indentured labor in its continuity with slavery. In today's Europe and elsewhere, work in the meat processing, sex work, agriculture and domestic work share many characteristics with classical indentured labor. This critique not only affects the substance of our work, but also our daily practice. At our workplaces, we will need to engage in conversations that may be painful and unsettling. And how could it be different when we begin to confront this, to, when we begin to confront the sediment that a long and violent history has left in the institutions that we embody in our day-to-day -day work? Some concrete ideas for this daily practice. Now we have figured how to do our teaching online, we may wonder how we can develop truly global curricula. This would require reconsidering their Eurocentric content, which is a good idea anyway, and it would require close cooperation with colleagues in the global south, among others, so as not to undermine their position. Also, those of, those of us who play a role in publishing as editors or reviewers can reconsider our policies and practices so as to figure out how they and how therefore actually how we can be so exclusive and so excluding. As fundraisers and funders, we should make every effort to get more funding for independent academic research in our field for colleagues in the global south. When organizing conferences, we can, we can ask ourselves whether it is really necessary to have them in places which are inaccessible to our colleagues from the global south, both because of, both because of the costs and because they are likely to be refused visa. And while, by all means, we keep complaining about how terrible it is that due to COVID, we are unable to get on planes every so often so as to meet each other, we might consider 
that online events allow for the participation of colleagues from places we may have never heard of and who may change, enrich and disturb our discussions in a way we cannot currently imagine. I'm aware that I suggest to engage in piecemeal change while the problem is fundamental and structural. And there's something unsatisfactory about that because these small responses seem to be of a different scale than the problem. But it does have the advantage of thinking about concrete steps which we can make in our daily work. This brings me to the end of my talk. But before I close, I want to express my gratitude to a number of people and institutions. First and foremost, the Franqui Foundation. It's an honor to be awarded this international Franqui professorship. I'm grateful to Ghent University's Human Rights Center and Marie-Benedicte d'Ambour in particular for making the effort of nominating and hosting me. I thank the university supporting my nomination, Antwerp, Hasselt, Leuven, Louvain, ULB, VUB, and Saint Louis, Bruxelles. Also, I want to thank my colleagues at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and those in Lund, as well as the colleagues I met through the network on migration and international law in Africa, the Mid Middle East and Turkey, Milamet, both the members of the core group, but also the colleagues in Senegal and the colleagues I look forward to working with in Morocco, to all of you. If you imagine you have noticed traces or more than traces of exchanges we had in what I just said, you are undoubtedly right. The academic work of teaching and research is highly social and it is a true privilege to do that in community with you. This is also why I look forward to getting to know more of my colleagues at Ghent face-to-face -face or through digital means, which will require some inventiveness. This lecture opens a series of teaching meetings that is called Classes of Excellence. Dear participants in those classes, confronting the colonial structure of international law is not some, something that one can do in isolation. And I cannot wait to begin working together. Dear wider audience, we will report back to you during a seminar on the 1st of June, and we will announce more about that at a later stage. Now, Dutch tradition requires that at this point, one expresses one's gratitude to one's loved ones. I will not follow this tradition. I can think of more effective means of communicating with my loved ones than through a live streamed public event. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Spekerbo. Normally you should hear an applause now. We have not simulated that, but I'm sure that the 177 attendants to this uh, lecture are uh, more than pleased by your incisive analysis. And I see at least some reactions with applause on a virtual uh, manner. Now, um, Following your, your own wish to um, have some interaction with the audience, which normally we should have had uh, during a reception uh, in a much more pleasant way, uh, we're going to turn that in a virtual uh, manner as well. And I would um, uh, open now uh, the question time uh, from a practical point of view. How can you ask your question? Well, you see on the bottom um, of your screen the reactions uh, icon. If you have the latest version of Zoom, you will see under that reactions icon a possibility not only to applaud, but also to raise your hand. And that would be the most logical way to ask your question, at least to make yourself uh, visible to us so that we can um, uh, give you the floor by allowing you to unmute your microphone and uh, switch on your camera to ask your question live. If you do not have a latest version, you might not have the possibility to raise your hand, I would then suggest that in the chat, which is open now, you just type the, the word question, not typing your question, but just typing the word question so that you can see that you have a question and that we can give you the floor again. So please, if you have any questions to um, the holder of the International Frankie Chair, Professor Spekabu, please manifest yourself. Yes, I do have a first from 
Cecil de Lange, I will um, make sure that you can switch on your camera and your microphone. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for your lecture. Um, I will go straight to it. J just briefly for all of you, I'm a professor of European Migration Law uh, at Radboud University, Nijmegen. Um, uh, Thomas, and uh, I know Thomas for a long time, so I'll just say Thomas. You frame your talk um, based on former colonialism. Um, I would really like to hear your thoughts of more modern um, and not necessarily north towards south um, examples of new colonialism, um, where, for instance, I have to think of um, uh, the Chinese purchase of harbors um, across the globe, uh, also in Europe, but, but at, well, a wider range um, of countries. And how would you frame that and possible their way of, of, of framing their right to do so? Um, would that fit in, in what you're working on? Um, or is that yet another agenda? Yeah, that's what you thank you for your question. Um, um, if if we look at the at the the the, the map at Yusuf Altamimi's map, uh, we see that that China is black and uh, and not white. So China is not um, a country that that enjoys this 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 Cadillac mobility status. However, of course, it's a dichotomy, and China is quite for a black country. It, it's doing quite well, and there are white countries that are doing a bit poorly in comparison to others. I think Germany is, you want to have a German passport and the Dutch is also quite okay. Uh, but the Brazilian, so Brazil was white on the map, uh, but Brazil is, is almost, it's, it's very close to the, to, to, to the, to the gray, to the gray zone. So, um, this kind of relation, the, 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 the advantage in mobility. So the, 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 the easy access of mobility that, that you and I have because we both have a Dutch password is never a safe possession. It has always changed, uh, as I have emphasized. Um, uh, under the 1868 Burlingame Treaty between the US and China, Chinese indentured laborers suddenly had an in, in, inalienable right to move. I mean, they had it for 15 years or so, but still, that, that's not so good for an inalienable right, but still, it, it was called an inalienable right at one moment. Well, it's never it's never static and it's always moving. I think that what you see now is that uh, China, which was never colonized, but did have to undergo the opium wars and basically had to live under diktats from 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 uh, uh, the United Kingdom uh, and 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 the US to some extent um, that they are getting getting on steam. They're, 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 uh, so they are they are coming up, and in I think in Africa they now have quite good mobility rights. Uh, they they can easily so Europeans also need to get a visa for many African countries. I once applied for one in in Benin. It was an easy online form, and I got the visa within literally seconds after I had wired the fifty uh, uh, US dollars that you had to to send in. So. The, that's a visa obligation, but it's it's a formality. So I think Chinese are doing quite well. Oh, you see them coming up, and 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 others are, are going down. So I have I one of the problems with with the with the story as I presented it is that for brevity's sake I had to to ignore all the nuances, and this has developed. You you do see that in in the, in the immediate post war era where colonial subjects suddenly get free movement because uh, colonial powers are scrambling to legitimize their, 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 their empires. And uh, so it's, it's, um, it, it fits the story, but of course we, we don't know yet where it's going. Thank you very much. And we have a second question from Tendai Akiume. I will again 
make sure that you can switch on your microphone and your camera. So please, uh, you have the floor. Okay, let me figure out how to turn off, turn on my camera if I can do that. Okay, I can't, but you don't need to see me for me to- We can to hear you, we can hear you, so that's perfect, fine. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. And Thomas, congratulations on this wonderful honor. And also thank you for a really um, inspiring and provocative lecture. You know, we're thinking in very similar spaces and, and I have to say, I learn a lot from you every time I hear you speak. So my question is, is one that I think, um, I, I would like you to kind of think at, at the deepest level about some of the, the insights that you've shared with us. And I'm trying to understand whether you see your intervention as an emancipatory one or as a diagnostic one. Um, and I think both kinds of interventions are really valuable, but they tell us different things. And the intervention I'm thinking about specifically is this push to, to not just international lawyers, but I think international lawyers, especially or international legal scholars of migration to brand international migration law as colonial law appropriately, and to think about other sources outside of the global north that are producing international law that pushes back against the kind of dominant colonial approach that we don't call um, what it actually is. It seems to me, and, and many others have said this, that international law is the law of empire. And I think if international law is the law of empire, you might think about the international law of migration or even just the control of migration as the means of empire. And so I wonder whether there is something, what I'm trying to get at, is there something inherently colonial about any dominant body of international migration law such that even if we pluralize the, the canon by looking elsewhere, the kind of hegemonic force of the colonial enterprise or the kind of power dynamics underneath will nonetheless mean that what determines who's dying in the Mediterranean and who's dying at the border between the US and Mexico won't be a version of international law that basically legitimates that kind of, of, of a project. And so what I'm asking is, you know, what is what what do we gain by pluralizing? Is it this just a kind of a diagnostic and better description of what the law is doing? Or do you see this kind of project to pluralize name correctly? as also itself having some kind of um, pathway to an emancipatory vision where you actually could have transnational relations that govern migration in some kind of legal regime that is just and doesn't reproduce kind of these unequal relations that we see as distinctive of, of colonialism. You have a tendency, thank you. You have a tendency to ask these extremely difficult questions. Thank you. Um, I have, I have, I have uh, uh, responses at, at, uh, at uh, two levels. The first is, um, listen, I'm a European liberal uh, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not liberal by conviction, but I'm, I'm a European academic. Um, and um, when I, when I, when I, uh, make this kind of analysis. I'm like, at the end of the 19th century, you had these very enlightened um, uh, employers who built good housing for their workers. Uh, in the Netherlands, one of the, one of the people in that category, Mr. Kwak, he was a, one of the first professors of, of public e of, of economics. He wrote a six volume uh, book about Marxism, about Marxist thinkers which when it was reissued in 1977, uh, Arthur Laning, a leading anarchist said was still one of the best works on Marx. So he took it so seriously that he really, I'm that kind of person. I'm, a, 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 um, um, I'm well-intentioned, but I, I, can, I have problems in jumping over the limits of, of my position. So that, that's, uh, that, that's one, of, one, of my, one of my responses. Um, and so I, I, I tend to replicate the, the problem of, yes, but open borders will lead to undercutting social standards. Trade unions fought hard for them. How can we, I have, I have problems in thinking beyond those, those limitations. Um, and um, 
one of the actually one of the very few uh, uh, attempts to go beyond that is your own work, where you uh, acknowledge that um, yes, inherently communities have can only exist as communities when they have some control over who is in the community. But then why do we suddenly deny um, uh, uh, that people from different parts of the world have an actual intimate link because as a result of colonialism, and the Netherlands is a very good example of that because of, of Suriname and the Dutch Antilles, where um, uh, the, the, these populations are completely mixed uh, the, the, uh, something similar for the for the for the for the populations of of the Netherlands and the, the former Dutch East Indies, the Indonesia, has only been disentangled by a kind of population exchange-like transfer of many 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 people. So, colonial ties. The, your your proposal to consider countries like the Netherlands and Suriname as one community that jointly decides about who it will admit from, let's say, other uh, 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 communities. I find that that's one of the very few examples I, I'm aware of, of thinking outside this, this nation state uh, uh, um, uh, discourse that can only think about open borders or uh, adjust borders. So, uh, so I'm, I think it's mainly diagnostic what I do because I'm I'm too much involved and too much stuck uh, as a European academic in the system as it is. I find that a very poor response. Okay, thank you. We have two more questions to come. Uh, Juan Manuel Amayo Castro, you now have the possibility to unmute and switch on your camera. Um, greetings from Bogota, Colombia. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be uh, present here with you all. Um, I also know Tom Thomas from a long time. Uh, he actually got me uh, into uh, migration law, um, and I want to press him a bit, a bit on the on the previous uh, exchange, um, because basically, uh, Thomas, the way I understand. Your um, your intervention it, it 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 has an element of anti formalist. Uh, you you say well there's a world of sovereign states but it turns out that they're not all equally sovereign. Um, uh, but then you your proposal at the end is actually a very formalist proposal. Uh, you know we should value uh, the not just the migration not produced in these more sovereign states, but also in these less sovereign states. Um, and in that sense, you, you reproduce the, uh, not just, not just the, 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 the formalist framework that you um, crit critique, you know, but you hope to, in that sense, I think you are both diagnostic and emancipatory in your, uh, in your ambition, because you want to make it uh, a better formalism, uh, not just an, uh, uh, a different than formalism. Um, but you're also, in that sense, uh, falling a bit into the shortcomings of formalism. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of uh, methodological nationalism, uh, a topic that we have discussed in the past. Um, and I would want to ask you a question. So what do we not see when we focus on the colonial relation. Even though the focus on the colonial relation unearths all of these um, interesting observations that you uh, identify, uh, what do we not see? And I would like to propose perhaps a focus on class. It's one of the things that we don't see. Uh, you made brief references to it, um, but uh, I think you should be making more than brief references to it. Uh, class shows uh, an incredible, incredibly broad sub-national dimension to the migration phenomenon. Um, and class also 
allows you to see migration law from a global perspective, not just from this methodologically nationalist perspective. It allows you, for example, to focus on global care chains. Um, class, after all, is also very much a part of migration law in all of these countries. So we have the map that you showed, uh, but the, what, one of the things that the map doesn't show is that somebody with a university degree or a millionaire from any one of these dark countries uh, actually has much easier access, uh, sometimes even uh, uh, more easier access than uh, a person from a white country uh, uh, that does not have these particular uh, class position. Um, and so I would like to invite you to uh, focus more on class. Hey Juan, can I say that I really love Zoom? Great to see you. Um, 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 uh, sure, uh, granted. Um, uh, give me another 50, 50, uh, 45 minutes and, and, and uh, let's, let's discuss class. Um, the kind of move that I make, I think is more, I think my critique is not anti-formalist, it's formalist. Um, what, what one of the things that has struck me in the past few years is that, and I will give one example, in West Africa, there is a number of, it's partly related to, to, to generation, there's a number of academics, of legal academics, who um, say things or write things that I find fascinating. Um, they describe migration as, as something perfectly natural. Um, partly they have uh, a historical discourse about that, about how Africa has worked always. Partly they point out that the borders in Africa are colonial borders and they're in the wrong place and they're not African. They, yes, they're African borders, but they, 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 they don't reflect uh, 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 developments that were the product of, uh, of, of African uh, 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 realities. They were imposed. They were compromises between European powers. And so they, they essentially say these borders, of course, we cross them all the time. That, that's normal. And that's, that's um, so when we developed free, free movement in West Africa in, in, in the framework of ECOWAS with all its, its shortcomings, the idea was to return to the, to the normal situation as it was before colonialism. What I find fascinating about that is that that's missed, completely missed, it's erased in, in international law because free movement in ECOWAS is seen either as copy paste from the EU, which it's not. It, it has its own uh, history. It's based in, it, it, it's a compromise between Pan-Africanism and, and African nationalism. But it's, it's something much more interesting than copy paste from the EU. Um, so it's partly a compromise that's very contemporary and, and is related to decolonization. And partly it's perceived by these authors as um, the normal state of affairs. Of course, we, we cross borders. In Europe, free movement is seen as, and it's described in the Schumann Declaration from, from 1950 as one of the ways to overcome a very long and painful and lethal history of European nationalists. These are two different forms of free movement. Now, what I, what I, the, the argument I try to make is that this African perspective, and I'm, I'm, I'm homogenizing it now and, and with all due apologies, there is a different discourse out there. It's not just an oppor opportunistic discourse, or at least it's not more opp opportunistic than the European one, and it's international law, and it cannot be discarded as, ah, uh, it's these funny Africans, they haven't, got, they, they, it, it's international law, and it's as much international law as what the Strasbourg court does. So that's, that's the, 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 let's say that that's within the limits of, um, uh, of the discourse of international law as, as I, that I can work with, uh, I think what you can do. Can, can do. Uh, so it's, it's, it's this, this, this uh, pushing these different perspectives that, I, that I'm after. And um, I'm, I'm unsure about the, the, let's say, the transformative character of it because it stays well within existing uh, methodology.
But so I, again, maybe I'm simply the wrong person to. Um, I mean, the revolution didn't start with liberal employers. Social democracy didn't start with liberal employers, but it was nice that there were some who were not um, in the way. But maybe I think I have, I have uh, a low um, uh, expectations of people in my position. Okay, thank you. A further question from Nicole Stibnarova. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Thomas. Um, we, uh, we, we've been um, previously in touch via email, um, but never had the honor to meet in person. So maybe let's consider this our first occasion. Um, thank you for the lecture and um, congratulations to the position. Um, my question is brief um, and perhaps uh, brief, but maybe too broad, but I wonder after all these years of researching about um, migration law and engaging with different schools of critiques, um, what do you think sovereignty is? And um, I mean, sovereignty as, it, as it's used in, uh, let's say, current European um, case law and um, policy preparatory works, laws, uh, etc., cetera, in, in the lingua of, of uh, governments. Do you think it's, just a metaphor for what's politically important or do you think it at times has some real value in itself and by that i mean does it at times stand for some vital interests or self-preservation of the state or society um of course being aware of uh, all that's been said about sovereignty as a concept by historical critical scholars, um, such as um, Engie, as you mentioned, or Chimney or Koskaniemi. Um, I wonder, what is your personal uh, take on sovereignty? Uh, again, um, you're asking uh, two difficult questions. Um, Let, let me let me let me give a, a uh, maybe maybe that's not what you intend to ask, but when I when I look at 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 the, the in 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 the state of Niger, which I think is if by one measure is the poorest country on earth and it's not a very powerful country, and th partly therefore it was discovered by European policymakers because it seemed an easy walkover. It seemed an easy country to intervene in because they would be willing, they would be um, uh, uh, they would be open to. Uh, proposals just like the Papua New Guinea government was open to proposals of Australia. Um, in uh, 2015, uh, the, the, a French uh, retired police officer drafted the law for Niger to implement the smuggling, human smuggling protocol, the Palermo, one of the two Palermo protocols. Uh, and that resulted in the Loi 2015-36 which uh, introduced carrier sanctions, which are obligatory under the, the, the smuggling protocol, not just uh, for uh, cross-border trips, but the law was formulated in such a manner that someone transporting people uh, in, on domestic bus trips uh, also needed to check um, a documentation. So when you travel on in one of these in, in, in Niger has, has, has very uh, 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 beautiful and, and, and air conditioned and, and well running buses. Uh, if you enter one of these long distance buses, you must be able to show who you are and that you have a right of residence. Then, and this is unheard of, carry, carrier sanctions on domestic trips on domestic trips. So if I take the train from Amsterdam to Rotterdam, I must show the legality of my presence on Dutch territory. That's, that's the parallel. Um, then I'm suddenly very concerned about sovereignty. Uh, then I think, well, this is an infringement of Nigerian uh, sovereignty uh, because the EU simply walks over and does something that undermines free movement, not only in West Africa, as many European policies do, but also within, within Niger. Um, so that is, uh, then I think sovereignty 
uh, doesn't mean much because um, Nigerian state sovereignty doesn't uh, doesn't amount to much in those contexts. Um, however, um, uh, uh, so, so Nigerian authors, uh, Abdullah Hamadou, uh, uh, has has said this is an infringement of Nigerian sovereignty. And there, I see the point. So I think I, that that sovereignty means different things to different not not people, but to different uh, states. And there, so I'm, I, I, take, I completely take on board uh, Tony Engi's uh, uh, analysis. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, um, I'll, I'll leave it at this, this, let's say, tiny example, which I think is a tiny example of, of something, something uh, uh, pretty big and we see it every day in, in, in migration law. Okay, thank you. I see that we have some people still um, on the list to have questions, uh, but we are getting a little bit beyond our time. So what I would propose is to take the four questions that we have. And luckily for me, the last question will come from Tamara last. So that fits and that closes the circle. But first we have uh, Tanjirul Islam, which I will now provide the possibility to switch on the camera. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Tanjur Islam, uh, and I think I'm very little person in this seminar because I'm an LLM candidate at Beijing Institute of Technology, and uh, I had been informed about the seminar by Supervisor Dr. Leo Gofu, Professor Dr. Leo Gofu, who is also an immigration uh, law expert. And uh, it's very a uh, nice seminar for me that Professor Thomas Spies Garber has given very in, informative, uh, uh, informative uh, his effort and uh, his uh, whatever he has done on this subject. I think it is very fruitful, but uh, my question that is uh, that I, uh, we know that colonialism in this era I think it actually actually doesn't exist in this time on recent, but before it it has very uh, uh, significance in uh, in the world politics and also in migration law. So my question is that actually uh, how much impact uh, the colonial structure has in immigration international immigration law in this era. Uh, basically, in recent time, what do you think, Professor? About it? Thank you. Thank you very much. We were going to take the four questions together, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's one by one, one by one. No, no. Oh, one, one by one, one okay. by one. No, no. Sorry, my my apologies. Okay, okay. Um, well, I, uh, I'll try to keep it short because we, indeed we're we're running 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 late. Apologies for that. Um, I do think that that's the 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 map I showed. So the 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 the, the inequality uh, of mobility rights. Uh, between roughly the global north and the global south, as, as blunt as that analysis is, uh, shows uh, 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 that that the the the, the colonial uh, past is still very much uh, a present, and it's also the, the 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 case law of the European Court of Human Rights, which is let's say the yeah the most most well developed and um, uh, um, a most pre prestigious case law on this point. It's it's it is about this this colonial point. It is an, a response to uh, litigation against the the British uh, late imperial uh, regulation of mobility. So I think the 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 the, the, the colon this colonial history is ongoing. Uh, white people can move where they want, and non-white people. Uh, much less so. That's it's a very blunt way of, of putting it, but that general uh, structure, I think, is is something that is that is ongoing. 
Okay, Matthias de Costa, you can ask your question. Hi, um, so thank you for your lecture and the thing that you said about COVID being an opportunity for people to join in and to participate in a lot of things um, now is so true. But what it also does is that it allows for simple PhD students like myself to ask really great questions to really, really great people and important people like you. So I would like to take advantage of, of this moment to, to build off what Tendaya Chume was saying, but also on what Nicole was saying on sort of thinking um, and go further because you were saying that international immigration law is inherently a product of colonialism and sort of a legacy of it and that it continues or that it perpetuates colonialism nowadays. So then, but if we think of international law as the empire's law and international law still being the empire, then, and also on sovereignty, then you can sort of see that the fact that people have to, or communities have to organize themselves in the form of a state is in itself and inherently a colonial construct, right? Because in order to participate in international law and international law has as its subject states. So if people do, and, and they're actually forced to participate in the international arena because of globalism, then that is in itself the fact statehood or, or the notion of a state and the fact that you have to organize yourself in the form of a state is inherently um, already a perpetuation of colonialism. And now you, you talked about um, open borders as sort of being a, well, as, as a possibility or a way to think out or through um, international immigration law being a product of colonialism. But then if you take that other premise series as international law being empire's law, um, then you have to go further. Do, do we still need states? And is, and I, I don't mean that this is the emancipation, I'm just, and I don't think, cause you've, you've told us that you don't know, but like what, simply what do you think of, of that idea that statehood, statehood as being a product of colonialism that then allows for immigration law? Um, do we need to go beyond the states? Do we need to abolish states? How, what's, possible in, in, in the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and, again, as someone invested in the social democratic, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I sympathize with the social democratic project. And so I, I'm not, not easy to let go on the state because I'm not sure what we will get in its place. However, if, if I again may point out that um, as, as little as I know about it, um, I think in, in West Africa, the state means something different. And it's not necessarily a, a very peaceful or a nice thing, but it is inspiring to think about uh, populations that do not identify with a state, but with a, with a, with a zone that may cross, board, may, may cross one or two borders. Um, one of the things that, that was pointed out to me by, by a Senegalese uh, legal academic is that uh, for these populations, many of them uh, uh, travel with their, with their cattle, that the, the, the free movement status of the cattle is quite well regulated, but the free movement status of these people is, is far less so because they tend not to have a nationality because they, they're mobile and therefore have not been registered as uh, state people. So you, there you see the clash between people who actually live um, um, yeah, across state borders and for whom the state is not uh, a major, uh, um, is not, not, not the primary form of organization. Um, so you, 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 see, you see people uh, doing that. The funny, the, 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 one of the interesting things is that the EU in its uh, border projects that it supports in West Africa is trying to make these borders and to make them more meaning, meaningful and to, to constitute borders and also to make them meaningful to people. So I think states are not the only form of, of, of social organization. They're the only form of organization that is, there's the strongest form of social organization in international law, but there are these other forms. And maybe we should let ourselves be inspired by the regulation of, uh, of the status of cattle in, in, in ECOWAS and see how they, how, they, how, they, how, they, how, they, how they do it and how they, how they conceive of it. So um, I'm, I'm sure you don't find this a satisfactory answer. I don't find it satisfactory myself, but thinking beyond the state, I think is, is, is very problematic. On the other hand, we shouldn't fetishize the state. There are people who, who actually uh, uh, don't, 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 um, you know, actually live their life regardless of states, but it leads to some problems for them. 
Okay, we have now Vincent Chetaille. Thank you very much. This is uh, uh, a pleasure. And uh, I mean, it was, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. It was a very interesting, inspiring, and needed call to revisit international migration. Obviously, as uh, mentioned rightly, uh, Tendai uh, Atum, uh, uh, this is not specific to this particular field, uh, uh, but this is a question for international law as a whole. Uh, and this is probably more uh, obvious for other branches, such as trade law, investment laws, uh, the colonial uh, uh, structure uh, of these. But of course, this is plainly relevant too for international migration law. I have two questions, in fact, uh, and uh, I, I will uh, uh, elaborate briefly uh, about uh, each of them. My first question, because is migration control uh, more about racial discrimination than colonialization because and of course the two notions are related but still different because in my own research on this uh, area I had the impression that racial discrimination more than colonialism was a triggering factor of immigration control not only because uh, migration control uh, has been literally invented by the US that was a non-colonial power at that time, but also because during the same period of time, colonial power, uh, such as uh, the UK, uh, France, uh, organized a system, uh, uh, a racial system of free movement within the colonial power. And this was not based on colonization, but more on uh, racism, in fact. So that is why I would like to uh, have your view about, uh, because uh, colon colonization is based on racism, but in reality, racism is more, I, I mean, to me at least, more uh, uh, relevant uh, as a triggering factor of immigration control than colonialism. This is my first question. And the second question, I, I would like to go a little bit beyond the, the, your own uh, assessment of the divide between academics from Global North and Global South. To, to, to have your view <clears throat> about the, the colonial structure of international migration law, but as a product of state practice. Uh, because I, I'm not totally comfortable with the, with the idea of opposing academics from the global north and the global south for uh, at least two uh, obvious reasons. First of all, the fact that an, uh, one scholar uh, describes the state of law does not mean that it, it, it is fine with uh, such a state uh, of law. And, uh, and also the second reason is that, and, and I was also uh, uh, personally uh, surprised, but in reality, uh, uh, most international lawyers from the global south have uh, endorsed in their own writing a very, uh, a quite, not absolute, uh, absolutist, but a very strong version of state sovereignty in the field of migration. Uh, there are many big names, uh, uh, Maurice Camto, uh, Be uh, Mohamed Bejawi, uh, but also uh, 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 less uh, known uh, scholars. Uh, I, was, I, I was surprised when I was involved in the drafting process of the free movement protocol of the African Union that uh, 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 all my colleagues in the room from uh, uh, the African continent uh, where uh, 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 the, it was uh, uh, difficult to uh, reconcile the notion of state sovereignty and free movement, and they, they, they were uh, 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 tempted to consider first state sovereignty, uh, whereas we were discussing about the drafting of a free movement protocol. So clearly, that is why I think that Opposing uh, global north and global south academics sounds to me too too simple to be to be true, and that is why I mean going further, uh, because after all, uh, what matters is not uh, the, the limited circles of academics. Uh, 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 what uh, is important in your uh, deconstruction exercise is to I mean to me is to to see uh, uh, also the colonial structure of uh, international migration law uh, uh, as a product of state practice. Because here, and I would, uh, I would be interesting to know more besides 
uh, 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 the, your, uh, your assessment of academics and uh, your case law, uh, the, uh, the, the state practice as reproducing the colonial uh, structure of international law uh, in, in general. So two, two questions. Thank you, and and th thanks for 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 being there. You must have recognized some of your own work in what I was what I was uh, telling. Um, I've I've I've, um, I've I've used it uh, very eagerly. Um, allow me to to be very short on the first question uh, because uh, following people like Ashim Bembi, I don't distinguish strong strongly between colonialism and and, and race, because uh, uh, if I understand them correctly. Uh, they uh, see uh, race as a concept that was produced uh, in its, at least in its, of course, ever earlier, but in its, in, in what it means today was was a product was 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 produced within and through colonialism. Uh, so I, I don't st strongly, uh, I don't sharply distinguish them. For the global north global south dichotomy, I think that's a constantly moving uh, uh, thing. It, it's not, uh, of course, it's not. Uh, uh, one should not be determinist about this. Um, there are, I think, clear differences in in perspective, and there are clear differences in position. Um, academics in the global uh, south, many academics in the global south. Um, um, I mean, they are so and so incredibly under resourced that they don't have the possibilities we in Europe or in North America have for uh, for uh, 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 for doing research and therefore for having a voice in uh, the international uh, discussion, except where they write commissioned research for the UN and the EU, and these organizations are dominated and uh, uh, by by the global north by the chinese exclusion version of international migration law um, so that that gives uh, uh, that limits the space for uh, academics from the global south to to have a say um, and uh, and also you you see in 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 if, if you if you once you once you see it you notice that academics from the global south with very few exceptions uh, and one of them is, is Chimney. Um, they, when they write an article, they they uh, they uh, either they do it themselves or they're made to do so by by editors. They um, uh, they 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 emphasize the specificity of the text. So it's it's always the, the case of Indonesia. While an article in the International Journal of Refugee Law about the most recent case law of the British Court of Appeal. In LGBT cases, does not do so. It, it, the title doesn't indicate it's British. Uh, the whole theory, uh, the whole writing is as if this is of global importance. So there, there is this, 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 this difficult structure, um, and I think it also it plays a role in 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 reviewing. Would a uh, um, uh, an academic from the Democratic Republic of Congo be asked to review? Uh, an article uh, that has been submitted, and that is about the British Court of Appeal uh, uh, case law on LGBT cases. I think that would be a good idea. Uh, the person is not an expert in it, but the person could indicate whether this is truly of global importance uh, or whether it's more appropriate for a local, uh, for a national journal. So th there is there is this, 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 this strong divide but on many, many levels. Uh, but this, it, it, it's a strong difference in 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 position and in in yeah in in power in the field uh, between uh, different academics, and I think that is something that that we actively participate in, and we need to reflect on. And we can we are free to reflect on that. We can do it. We can think of our own editorial practices uh, in this, and 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 there's space for us to do that. State sovereignty is so the idea that global South academics are not so uh, for state sovereignty. Well, of course, that depends because state sovereignty is, as Tony Engie so brilliantly uh, uh, has analyzed in his book, is a bit of a moving target. And um, uh, maybe in the global North, it's very uh, cool to be post sovereign. In the global South, states may want their, may, may need theirs, and, and academics may sympathize with that. 
they may identify with that uh, to to they, they may like to 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 insist on the sovereignty of their state to protect themselves against interventions from the United States or the EU. So on state sovereignty, there I think I, I, if I gave the impression that that there is a global South academic party line on that, no, not at all. It's it's a, a very very um, mobile uh, 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 notion. I'll keep it at that. Okay, thank you. And now we have the last question from Tamara. Last, I will make sure that you can unmute yourself for the question. Hello, um, my video is also not working. Sorry about that. Um, congratulations, Thomas, and thank you for your uh, very interesting um, lecture tonight. I will be thinking about it for a while, but I wanted to ask or prompt you to maybe do something that you had deliberately avoided. But um, when you made the statement that colonialism and race explain the structure and grammar of international migration law, I immediately thought then, what is the role of international organizations, the UN, UN agencies in particular, IOM? Um, because of course, of their, I mean, I don't need to prompt, I, I, I would also like to very much hear what you would say, how you would structure it, but I think in particular of their normative role, but also of their role in funding and structuring and setting agendas um, it, for migration policy development in the global south at regional and national levels. Thank you, and I, I can't see you, but great to see you, great to hear you. Um, the, yeah, the, the UN would, um, at, you, it would be possible, one idea would be that the UN would be the place where this um, pluralist uh, um, uh, vision of international migration law would, would, would be shaped. I'm afraid it's a bit um, more, um, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm afraid that that's too optimistic. Uh, UN, especially UN agencies, are funded by the Global North and they are, they don't have much space for doing that. And you can see the different funding modalities, uh, they, 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 they have effects on how much space organizations have. IOM in many of its projects is simply rolling out the Global North uh, perspective on, on migration. Uh, UNHCR has, because of its more formalized mandates, a bit more space. Uh, but they, they don't have much room for maneuver. One thing I would like to look at, and which I haven't had the opportunity to do, is to look at the case law of the UN Human Rights Committee. I think the UN Human Rights Committee, which is much more, uh, which has a very wide, uh, broad, wide uh, uh, composition, uh, I think they have never explicitly taken on board the Chinese exclusion um, uh, version of international migration law. I think that they have... Um, so they have never, never made this Strasbourg move of, of uh, states don't have to justify exclusion, um, but it's, it's, it's migrants who have to justify their, their uh, non-exclusion. Um, so they, they never made that move, I think. They have reached similar results by uh, making their judicial scrutiny less intense. So they're, they're, it's a different um, uh, uh, strategy to kind of pacify the, the, the global north position without the global south giving up on a more um, um, mobility oriented uh, uh, perspective. So I, that's something I really would like to look at. And uh, maybe that's it's, it's to, yeah, so I, I think the, the, the agencies are very much, they have their, their hands are tied to a, to, to a, to a great extent. Um, and for, for the Human Rights Committee, uh, I think there you see how important it is that Global South actors are at the table. They also can't work wonders, uh, but they, they, I think we, we need to analyze the, the, the international, the, the UN level uh, uh, for that reason. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Sperkeboer. I think you have gone half an hour beyond the scheduled time, but I think it was worth it. I would like to thank you probably on behalf of all the uh, participants for your very inspiring lecture. I think uh, I heard the word several times. Uh, thanking as well again, um, uh, Professor Van Moerbeek from the Frankie Foundation to have him present uh, tonight. And of course, for the support he gives for uh, the opportunity which is given to you, Thomas, to, um, to uh, intensify research collaboration with different uh, Belgian universities. Um, and to all of you, um, well, probably most of you will be uh, safe at home. I would like to wish you a safe journey back to the living room or to the kitchen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and you'll hear from us for further events relating to that uh, Frankie chair. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.